Hi guys, this is Cindy from Part Time Permies. Hello, <coughs> Michael. <laughs> he forgot his name. No, I'm joking. That's a Mike Pratt thing to do. I was actually. reading updates. You're reading updates. Oh yeah, my updates on my computer are just flashing from like Friday on, even though my computer's been on the whole thing, the whole time. I got an update notice for a Wholesome Roots live show Friday night. And I'm like, that didn't work very well. I've already seen it. <laughs> so hello, we have a decent number of people in the room already. I'm actually just, just uh, adjusting my screen. So, so Incense Shop, I think, is new, and Brown Coat, I want to say, is new or been a while. Brown Coat, I've been seen while, on so. other channels, and I think they've been here before. I almost said he, but I don't know if it's a he or she, actually. Um, and Bree's here. Yep. Incense Shop. Green Gables Home said has been here before. And Lois Ann Therapy and Curie have all been here before. So welcome back, you guys. Or welcome, to begin with. Um, and <laughs> yeah, good. We're having a good night here, too. Busy day. Busy. Yeah, it's been pretty busy. Been cleaning up odds and ends and getting ready for another busy week. And you got a chance to sleep in a little bit this morning. But now I was going to go back to bed after letting the chickens out. But I just worked through the day. So and I slept in longer than I was... <laughs> yeah, so that's a whole nother matter, but um, I do that sometimes too, um, mainly on naps. But anyway, so actually, I should probably double check and verify everybody can hear us, correct? Just let us know. I think there's also a bit of a delay on um, <clears throat> on the show as usual. The usually... question is putting full ground. She is full height and length, but she is quite thin. Yeah. Uh, so she will probably uh, fill out a little. Fill out over time. Yeah. So when we had we had two previous uh, giant dogs, a Saint Bernard and a Great Dane, and I think our Saint Bernard probably ended up full grown by about three years old. Um, he definitely grew really fast the first year, and I don't think his head had filled out completely until the third year. I think that was the last thing to catch up with things. Um, and I think even Jello, Jello was always kind of skinny too until we had him on prednisone, but, um, but he, I think. Things tend to be pretty active when they're younger yeah. and as they get older, they get really lazy. So <laughs> they frequently put on quite a bit of weight as they get in their later years. Yeah. So we don't really worry about her being thin because she'll probably decide to eat a whole bunch and not do anything at some point. Yeah. So. Um, so actually I wanted to give you an update on Budden anyway, so why don't we do that? Last week, for those of you guys who watched last week's live show, you know that Mike's dad arrived towards the end of the live show, well, probably at the middle, towards what was supposed to be the end of the live show. We went a little late, um, and Puddin went nuts. She started barking, barking, guarding, and, um, she was just, you know. And she's spent time with him before, so yeah, she, she knows, knows him. She knows him, so. She knows him pretty well. So I just wanted to show you a picture of after the live show, after she settled and he sat down and she just went up and greeted him like, oh yeah, I know you. I didn't need to bark at you. So sorry for the interruptions at the end of the show last week, but that was kind of funny. And we have a cat who's going to join us. You'll probably see his tail. Yeah. Um, Helix just jumped on her lap uh, because he's missing his evening lap time, I guess. Um, we also had another breakthrough and I'll have a little video on this, but I'll give you guys a little sneak peek for those of you guys that have been following our, our progress with when she is extremely shy, um, very shy dog. She kind of holds back and runs away and almost has a fear of being trapped. Um, but she doesn't mind being on a leash once she's on a leash. She doesn't like people to approach her at all. But uh, yesterday we got her on leash and we got her on a walk and I did it again today and got her back out and on a walk today. So she hasn't had a collar on in about a month because we couldn't get close enough to get anything over her head. Yeah. So when I put the leash on her, that's uh, one of those chain collars um, on that leash. So that's not a permanent collar. So before I took her off leash, I put her permanent collar on her. So she is, um, she has had her first walks with us. I mean, she had a walk with me before your sister left because yeah. she yeah, was your sister's dog. Um, 
she had a couple walks. We didn't even realize it was going to be an issue. We would have made no. sure that we had a collar on her before she left. Yeah. Because she's just so used to, you know, previous owner, which was his sister. Um, so, but we did get her out on walks and we had her on a long walk today. And then I put her, I basically attached her leash uh, to a second leash and then put it around my waist. And she went out to the garden with me. She doesn't pull at all. Uh, so she's, she's good. Um, oh, breakaway. Was that for us for hitting 1000? Thank you. We're actually approaching 1100. I noticed that's awesome. Um, that happened July 4th. I want to yep. say, yeah, on the holiday. So she's two years, not, not six months. She's two years old, two years old. She's two years old. Yeah. So she's, she's a pretty tall girl. Just, uh, that picture she doesn't look as big, I think, because I'm looking down that's a, at her. Yeah, that's a weird. It's a angle weird angle. That she's blending in. She's almost chest fire cat this on one, the patio. Yeah, this one you could tell a little bit bet, better how tall she is. Although she does kind of shrink down when she gets when she's a little nervous. Um, but then after her spending her day on leash or a few hours, not hours, but a while on leash with me and spending time with me, she crashed on the house, on the house, on the couch. Oh my gosh. I'm exhausted too. Um, she crashed on the couch. So she's shoving her nose in the pillow and it's all curled up with that, with that couch. So she's, um, back to the couch now curled up in a little ball behind us. So she's doing well. She's just, you know, slowly getting there. She is getting to the point where she will let me pet her more. Um, I can pass her. She's getting to know the routines, I think, is part of it. So she knows that we're not, like, going to get her. She knows when I'm walking down the hall, she can walk ahead of me because she likes to follow behind. She yep. doesn't like to feel like someone's following her. Yeah, she doesn't like the tight spaces. She doesn't like anybody approaching, and she doesn't want to make any decisions about. Yeah. yeah, and I think she, if she is followed, I almost feel like she feels like she's being chased rather than. Yeah anything so even if you have two people in the room looking at her in different areas she wants to leave the room yeah yeah she you, you could tell she almost feels she just feels trapped by it so but we're getting there it's coming along and our hallways are a little well they're average hallways but they're the narrow passes board. through some bedroom areas and it's not um it's narrow for a great dame it's yeah it's, <laughs> I mean, it's an average home but it, it's not an overly large one so they're only like four feet or yeah. five feet wide so uh, back there, she so she has to turn around, which she feels a little trapped. Yeah, she does. So yeah, so she is getting there. Um, uh, I'm trying to see if we missed anything else. Little is relative. <laughs> well, we've only yes. had really big dogs, so it's funny that our big. We had a Great Dane in St. Bernard previously, and our male Great Dane was a little on the small side at 120 pounds. And she's about 120. She's about the same size as yeah. he was. So, And we called him Little Boy because yeah. he looked kind of small compared to our St. Bernard. And St. Bernard was over 200 pounds. Yeah, which was, a, and so, but we just thought of them as big but normal dogs. <laughs> and then you, and everybody else thinks they're so huge, but yeah. we're really used to them. And then it's nice. You don't have to lean down to pet them. You go see other dogs. There. Our neighbors have some, they, There's new some... neighbors moved in and they have three um, labs. labs, black labs. Yeah. And they're average to short, a little on the short side, black labs. They're average back. Yeah. Black but labs. To, I'm like, God, the labs are so tiny. Why are they so tiny? But well, it's because we're used to such tall. Green Gables has chihuahuas. Yeah, and the chihuahuas are, like, smaller than I'd the head scared. of some of our dogs. I'd be scared I'd sit on the chihuahua. Like, without, you know, I've had my cat sleeping on the couch before and almost basically sit on him. But chihuahuas, chihuahuas seem so small bone that I would be afraid I'd break something. The smallest dog we've had is is bulldogs, like English yeah. bulldogs. Your, your family, Our family, yeah. and they're usually in the 30 to 40 pound range, but they're very compact. Yeah. So that's this, that's about as small as it's yeah. ever been, Renard. The our smallest house. dog I've ever had was a Springer Spaniel, and again, she was probably that's a about medium. forty pounds yeah, too. That's a good medium ish. So, um, otherwise, we I grew up with uh, golden retrievers. Otherwise, so but we like our giants because you don't have to lean down to pet them. They're right there. You can walk and pet them at the same time. They're just within your arm length away, so it's really easy. Um, so yeah. Anyway. 
we're we're fans of the giants. We it's small dogs are fun. We just love our giants. We just like the big. We like the mastiff breeds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We like Newfoundlands. We've never had Newfoundlands, Saint Bernards, and Great Danes, and Neapolitans, and all those fun ones. Yep. Um. Anyway. Um. Oh, Jello was running like a horse around me in the yard today. No, that would be uh, pudding, not Jello. Sorry, I keep calling her Jello. Jello is our last great thing. Pudding. Can we have enough food names? We didn't name either one of them. <laughs> no, we didn't. They came named, but we we never changed the names. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, Jello was Michelangelo. Yeah. So. But um, okay. So did we get a video up this week? I got one video up this week, and it was a chicken compost system kind of going over the first step of cleaning out the run area. And we tend to move the run material to the garden directly after it's been sitting there all season. So um, so that was part one. Part two is the next part of cleaning out the coop for the winter. I don't have the chickens in this coop in the winter because I have them moving around the yard in a tractor. So um, this has been resting all season. Yeah, we didn't have time. You, we would have probably cleaned out in the spring and put it on the garden pre-planting but we were so busy that we didn't get it cleaned out so. dainty's 55 pounds i didn't know dainty was that heavy no way she okay she looks tiny to me <laughs> she's tough I mean, yeah she is a tough girl she's big but jello yeah. picked her up <laughs> well uh, when she was a little yeah little bit, she was yeah. a little smaller yeah. then um, she was probably 35 or 40 pounds when he, she picked, probably was. he picked her up yeah um they were both a little smaller yes Okay, anyway, so we do have that one video if you want to check it out. It's on our chicken compost. Otherwise, um, we also had, I got out into the garden this weekend quite a bit. It was supposed to rain today, but um, I did get out there and harvest. I need to do a lot more harvesting, but I started harvesting some, the hot pepper section. So we have six types of hot peppers in this pile, I believe. Um, kohlrabi, some baking beans, um, some two big okra, and then some smaller okra, and some spearmint. I think that's all of it. So we did get a lot out of the garden. I still have about half of the baking beans to pull, and they're a heirloom breed. Uh, breed. That's not an animal. Um, they're heirloom type from uh, New York. So we got them from, what was that group in New York? The um, oh. pink spanking beans. Oh, that, that's part of the slow food architects. Yeah, yeah. So each state or region selects like five, uh, at least five items for their arc of taste that are significant, uh, heirloom, regional. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Cool. Oh, cool. Irish wolfhound. Curious. Yeah, that'd be fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, that yeah, Big dogs do keep away, you know, sales people that you don't want there <laughs> um, yeah they make a pretty big wolf people don't even see them usually they just hear yeah it, in our house um you can hardly see in our front window unless the light's on in there that room but when we had our saint bernard and our great dane both barking at the front door they scared a lot of people away i would believe yeah nobody wanted <laughs> <No way. laughs> they're huge huge deep wolves so yep there's that um I have, what else do I have? Oh, yeah. Do we have, I should double check, but we have this series going. And if you guys aren't on our Facebook group, you can check that out. The link is below. And my Facebook page just went blank. There it goes. Um, so I was just going to check if there was anyone who left a question for Mike or if you do have any questions for Mike you can ask him right now on um, on anything cooking related if he doesn't have the direct answer now he'll get back to you on it but if he has a quick that can actually often stimulate a big discussion at times um, so check that out but let me see if there's anything new I don't think there is anything new because there's no notices up here but sorry I'm messing with my web page at the same time um, and it's being slow. Very slow. Look at that. Okay. Nope. No new questions on the web page. So it's up to you guys. Do you have any specific cooking questions for this week? Um, <laughs> Curie says she was about eight or nine and came to her chest. 
that Irish wolfhound. That's awesome. So, and it, um, there may be a delay here, of course. Yeah. So, any cooking questions? Green Gables has requested to join your okay. Facebook group. I, yeah, just got that notice. So, I will definitely approve you for that. Um, I post the, I was a little late in posting that notice tonight. It was just a couple hours ago. I meant to do it earlier, but forgot to. So, uh, but you can keep your eyes open on Sundays. I'll post that. And it'll also be a reminder to, um, to watch the live show at night. Cause I'll have a little reminder in there. Um, yeah. And my website is being very, very slow. So go back to the questions. It's a fly that keeps buzzing around here. oh no yeah fly got in what's the best way to use basil oh my gosh i used it so many i had it today if you saw the slideshow of pictures going through today we had a caprese sandwiches for lunch um she needs to pick so all if you have a lot frost. of basil um yeah and it go it's very perishable it doesn't yeah. like to get dried out it doesn't like to get too hot it doesn't like to get too cold um and it browns out real quick it doesn't like to get bruised so if you're not going to use it quickly uh fresh you can dehydrate it and make basil flakes but you need a lot of basil flakes to end up with much of anything so you're better off probably just buying them commercially mm -hmm. so other mm -hmm. things you can do is uh, and it doesn't freeze well however you can chop it up and put it in a little bit of oil or a touch of oil and water and then freeze it into like an ice cube okay. like an oily ice cube and you can pull them out a little bit at a time and you'll have a chopped basil. You can obviously grind it into pesto and puree it with uh, just basil, or you can add arugula or even parsley or spinach. If the basil gets really hot and spicy and strong near the end of the season or in the heat, you can um, you can blend in other things. So you can make a nice pesto, and that also, because it's got the oil and if it has cheese or other things, it will hold for a while, um, but I, you can also freeze it. And... Um, Again, freeze it in chunks and then pull it out. It works really well. You just use it right away. Um, the other thing you can do is make basil oil. So you can chop it up and you know, rinse it, chop it up, puree it really good. And there's two ways to make uh, herb oils. One way is to take the fresh herbs and plunge them into hot neutral oil, just a vegetable oil, or um, and plunge it in there. It'll foam right up, and you need a lot. You need like handfuls of it of um, herbs to the oil and you let it fry out so all of it'll you know boil up so you need to not fill the pan more than halfway full of oil and then you can um, put all that uh, herb and then and then you can put the stems and everything else or even mix a few herbs let it dehydrate out and almost fry out not brown but take all the water out and then turn it off um, after it, it foams up and let it sit and then you can decant the oil um, and it will be flavored and, and also colored. Um, the other thing you, the opposite way is you can take it from cool oil, put a whole bunch in there and then turn the heat on high and have it come all the way up, um, to heat. And, um, and then it'll, it'll start bubbling cause you'll have water in it from the herbs that will come out and then do the same thing, shut it off, uh, let it sit. And then you're going to need to strain it out. It, it makes the most sense to puree the herbs up a bunch, um, to release more of the oils. And uh, you don't want to burn it. You can burn them. But uh, so there's two methods of making basil oils um, on trying to hold the color and hold the flavor. And I don't know. I'm kind of mixed on which one works better. Um, so that's so you can make um, an herb oil, basil oil, onion oils, whatever. And, um, and then you strain it out and you can um, hold it. Now, most oils should be held no more, should be refrigerated and should be held no more than a week or so. Probably you go a little longer in a fridge. Because you have that possibility of botulism, putting any of your things coming from the ground into oil, even at the high heat, uh, unless you've acidified the oil, and then you'd have to put in like citric acid crystals or something to pH it. Um, so your best bet is to keep it refrigerated, uh, use it relatively quickly, uh, keep it, and or you could even freeze that oil in the bottle, you know, in a little squirt bottle, and just freeze it, let it thaw out, and use it when you need it. So. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Once you strain, it can sit on the counter. Traditionally, it was left on the counter in restaurants, left on the line, um, and and most of the time you're fine. The problem is you do have a risk for botulism. Botulism is only killed in extreme heats, 
even that tryout process may get it, but it may not. You can't be certain. Uh, it's better than boiling, so you might actually, if you do the high temperature fry, you might actually uh, get a good kill on the botulism. So in that case, leaving it out, and in restaurants, people did it frequently, but the health department's really on top of that. Um, because if if there's any, especially if there's some water trapped in there and the oil and such, you can get um, you know sporing of the uh, botulism, and then it will uh, become highly toxic. And of course, you can't smell it or see it or taste it. Uh, you'll just so get you really no sick uh, a few hours later. So it is recommended not to keep them around too long. Now, if you have some vinegar in there, if you're doing a vinaigrette and you're making an oil, you know, and strong vinegar, herbs and such. Um, onions, all those things. And by the way, green beans and onions and, and those type of things that you're canning are the most common for botulism. Tomatoes can also be. They're not acidic enough by themselves always. Uh, but green beans are classic or things with, even if you've added chopped herbs to something. Uh, but if you do a strong vinaigrette that's say a, you know, a one part strong vinegar to two or three parts oil, that is typically kept on the counter in mm. most places. And I, my understanding is, I have to check, my understanding is that is safe. There's enough acidity in it. Uh, so just be careful. Um, chances are fairly low, but the result of botulism is typically paralysis or death. Uh, it's <laughs> yeah. really, really severe, so it's not worth messing around with. Unless you have a doctor injecting it into your forehead. No. Yeah, well, that's, that's, <laughs> that's extracted, Botox. neutralized. Yes. You'll wonder where Botox gets its name. Botulism toxin. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that's been suppressed and highly controlled. Yes. Yeah, so. I still don't get it. So, <laughs> yes, yeah, don't be afraid to make basil oils, make vinaigrettes, do all those purees, add oil, um, submerge things in oil. You know, um, It's all good, but keep them refrigerated. And while mm -hmm. a, a restaurant, you're supposed to go a week, I think just this is just personal opinion. My understanding is you can probably go a month or more, but don't keep them in there six months, two years. Yeah. And we're like, oh, is this still good? Don't don't question don't push it. it. Just throw it away. Yeah. After after a reasonable period of time, otherwise, go through the freeze process, mm -hmm. um, and and hold it. Freezing does not kill botulism, but it slows everything down. So you can do really nice. Uh, mostly, the reason you want to freeze is to preserve color. Mm -hmm. Now, if you thaw it out, you'll it'll go brown. But if you go right from frozen or slushy, because if it's got the oil in the cube, it'll be kind of soft. And then you're putting it right into a dish, into a paella or, a, you know, or whatever it is you're using. Yeah. Um, it'll do great uh, going right in there and be convenient. And Carrie, I agree. Living in New York for 10 years has, I love the, you know, Caprese pizzas, basically, uh, with fresh mozzarella, fresh tomatoes, good tomatoes, and fresh basil on it. That's a perfect pizza. Yeah, but they don't do it right in Michigan. Yeah, they really um, they don't they don't do any part of it right. Honestly, no, they don't the use sauce fresh. Sauce is not good. The mozzarella generally is available, but not good. It's usually not fresh. Um, it's usually just the regular old cheese that the they put on. Crusts the pizza. in Michigan are fine, but they're very bready and yeah. thick and generally soft. Um, I like their crusts. It's just it, a different it's okay. Style. It's different. Yeah. Uh, so it's, yeah, Caprice is, I would be really careful ordering a Caprice in our area because they're just disappointing. Yeah. Um, and but New York, that was awesome. Or you could just make it yourself. Make it ourselves, which yeah. is, yeah, which works. Yeah. yeah Green Big wants to know about sprouted flour. Yeah. I have not worked extensively with sprouted flour. Goat's milk mozzarella, I don't know if I've had it. I know it exists. I've had, of course, buffalo milk mozzarella. I've had a well, a lot of people who have goats will make I their own. I think I've had, I think I have had it though. We had some really good specialty shops in New York that we worked with. And I want to say I had some samples and, and you know, it's, it sounds like it's great. A little yeah. more flavor. Yeah. Uh, I'd love to The beauty it. of cow milk or buffalo milk is that it's sweet. It's yeah. got a sweetness. Goat milk has a nice, uh, a little more rich. Um, so yeah. It's got sometimes a, a little bit of a funkiness to it that I just like and goat cheese yeah. and stuff. Now, uh, going back to sprouted flour. Um, so sprouted flour is the process of she it starting it. to um, starting to germinate. Um, and so the first couple of days, so it gets wet and warm and it starts to grow and you get a sprout. You get a sprout. Um, the reason you do that is it activates enzymes and it also sweetens it up. That's the process of molting or malting, which is the process of making malt syrup. But also making, uh, which is typically malted grains are used not only in, for flavoring, but they're used for bread. 
uh, I mean, and, and for bread they're used for beer. Uh, so you you have to malt your grain, typically barley, uh, before you make beer because it releases and makes it sweeter. And then you go th and then you stop it either by drying it uh, and heating it to kill it, or you go and then you possibly go through your toasting process to make it um, darker shades, sort of like coffee beans, to create your different uh, your different beer flavors. But when you're so when you're cooking with it. Ideally, so traditional flour, you mill it, you take the outer husk comes off, then you strip off the bran, unless you're doing a whole wheat, and you remove the endosperm, which is a little, if you've got a little nugget, there's a little piece up here, oh, yeah. that, that the endosperm has the fat in it and has some of the other vitamins and minerals and such. It's very healthy, but that's what goes rancid first. So if you remove that from your flour, uh, you basically crack it and it comes off, um, you can get a stable flour, uh, which is good for baking. If you leave that in the bran, some or all the bran on, you get a whole wheat, mm -hmm. which has a bigger flavor, but you got to always watch. Your whole wheat will go bad much faster than a white uh, flour because it's not been set up to be preserved. So it would actually be a negative if you started sprouting it. Typically, it either happened naturally or accidentally through history, but in current baking, if you sprouted wheat unintentionally, it's it's a negative. You've ruined the flour pre uh, pre milling it. But what people think is well, it's like not what they think. It's true. Uh, when you go through that malting process, you release enzymes which activate the the growth cycles and release additional nutrition as well as flavor. And while some of those enzymes are released, it may start to break it down and make it uh, easier to digest. So they go through that first process typically of, and then they, after um, a short period of time of growth, which is a day or two, then they stop it by heat or by just dehydrating it. And that's what they're selling you. And so it is, um, could be enzymatically activated if it isn't heated too much. Mm -hmm. And then they make bread. So the thought being if you make bread with sprouted wheat or any sprouted grain, you're going to have all these enzymes active and you're going to have a more healthy, more um, nutritionally um, available food substance and that it may possibly be better to uh, digest. Um, however, as you start some of those processes, I believe you break down the gluten some yeah. because you're starting to eat. Um, you know those enzymes are starting to break down the other proteins, and that's what makes the bread chewy. And you need the yeah, and you need the gluten for the for the bread. Uh, you also for the when you have the endosperm and the germ in there, and the bran and everything, you end up. I'm sorry, they remove the the um, the germ, not the endosperm. The endosperm is the okay. starchy, is the starchy capsule portion of it, which is what is the primary part that you use. So. Uh, when you put all those things together, you're going to have more fat and protein, and you're going to have this rubbed fiber, which interacts. Just like it's very hard to make 100% whole wheat bread, you typically cut it either 50-50 or maybe two parts whole wheat to one part uh, white flour. Um, I'm going to, and I haven't worked much with making bread with spread flour, I'm going to guess you're in the same situation. It doesn't want to hold together real good, which means you're going to have to do a couple things. You may have to break it down a little bit with some sourdough starters. You may have to cut it with some white flour, some bread flour that's a high protein, high gluten bread flour. So it's a, a partial. Um, or you could take your grains and you could put a uh, you know, couple tablespoons of pure gluten, vital gluten into it, uh, which you may or may not want to do. But that's one way when you have a real high grain content that's not a high protein wheat flour, uh, you're going to add in gluten to make sure it all holds together. Yeah. So that's Ends up like a brick. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so if it's ending up like a brick, yeah. you're, you're having issues primarily with rising. Rising is based upon trapping the air in the matrix of your dough, which is heavily dependent upon your gluten structure. The gluten creates that stretchy elasticness so you can blow it up like a balloon. Yeah. Pure gluten, if you mix it with water and into a ball, you can, when it, you can actually blow it up in the oven like a <laughs> huge balloon. That's so um, you're inter you're either inter you don't have enough gluten or you're interfering with your gluten, plus you're adding in more fats and other things in your in your basic recipe because of the um, the sprouted grain. So I would say either the recipe is a dud and keep looking for <coughs> other recipes. Um, if you know that recipe works, 
Uh, and I've had some sprouted grain breads, and they do tend to be a little heavier. I think they're highly interacting with the gluten. So yeah. if you're not a problem with gluten, add in, start with two tablespoons of gluten, and then try going up or down from there. I guarantee you you'll get a better rise and a better crumb. Yeah. If you're trying to avoid gluten, um, you can adjust your water. You can adjust your fat content down. Um, you can try putting other flours in. But uh, if you're really trying to get around the gluten, then you're probably stuck with a with a hard loaf. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's not surprising that's your issue. Different kind of bread. You can also try it. I mean, you could try adding eggs. Um, eggs and flaxseed lecithin and some of the are nice emulsifiers. They're used in place of, they will not fully replace gluten, but those are two other alternatives. Um, or, just darn fly. fly. <laughs> I know. I... Keep coming around. Um, Duck in here. Yeah, eggs, uh, flour, dairy, sometimes uh, non fat dry milk powder is another way to add protein and add structure. Uh, and you really have to dig around on professional baking websites. It, it can be done. So, yeah. 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 Any suggestions for making oxtails? Make it often. <laughs> uh, oxtail soup? Oxtail. Yeah, I mean, I've, geez. So oxtails, European style, you braise it in, in, a, in a sauce, in a heavy brown sauce or demi glace. You usually sear it, flour it, or, you know, flour, sear it. Um, nice brown stock vegetables, cook it. You need to cook it three or four hours to get all, uh, you know, like any yeah, heavy down. braise to get all that interconnective tissue. Um, Fire is left. It is. It was getting hot in here, too. It, yeah, no, it's down to briquettes, basically. So you can do that European style stew, add a lot of red wine or marsala or things, a lot of ways to do that. Sure, green green um, It's really good. Um, I worked with a lot of Caribbean, Jamaican, uh, other, other Caribbean um, staff, mm. Haitian, and so they tend to put a little curry on it. Uh, they would still do a, they would do a rapidly boiling stew. Uh, they would boil it in some more neutral water or, or chicken stock or something. Um, have onions and some curry powder, yellow Caribbean style curry powder. And then typically they may add some flour. They may add dumplings, cornmeal and flour dumplings. They're either big round guys or little rolled um, logs. The um, so bourbon hillbilly, it's like 40 something degrees outside yeah. here tonight. Yeah, it's got a little cool all of a sudden. Yeah. Uh, and then you can add. Uh, in the Caribbean style, you're going to add heavy chunks of garlic and carrots, potatoes, maybe other root vegetables, and you're going to make a heavy stew. So you're going to have the dumpling, the flour dumplings, or the flour and cornmeal dumplings. You're going to have the oxtail, which is really just creating flavor and gelatin. You're going to suck on them, get a little bit of the meat off, and but then you have all these vegetables built into a very hearty but rustic stew and, and, and many times a touch of curry. Although sometimes it has a little burned um, sugar on it and it's called it's called a brown stew yeah and it could have some other seasoning and not the curry so yeah. those are the three uh the th well and then italian you know there's the italian style so whatever you do you're going to end up cooking it in liquid for at least three hours to break it down and if you do that and add some salt and pepper everything else will it'll taste great no matter what yeah uh, oxtail tends to be a little expensive uh, just because there's only one tail on a on a 600 pound Animal. steer yeah uh, you only get one towel uh uh one tail but it's good you can do the same preparation for cow cow foot or cow heel which is another caribbean specialty you braise down the shank or the very bottom of the shank which has a ton of gelatin um and just a little bit of meat and uh yeah yeah anyway uh, so yeah, yeah 40s like February. <laughs> yeah, we could be minus five in February. Well, we got into the the mid to upper 60s today, but yes, the temperatures are starting to fall. Our well, average would, yeah. our average day of first frost is October 3rd, but we're not going to hit that because we're going back into the 70s and 80s this week. So, or 70s anyway. Yeah. In February, we'd be lucky if our high is 40 most of the time. We'd be really lucky if our high was 40. Yeah. Although I think on my first some of my first Sometimes videos. It is. Yeah. yeah, some of my first videos I had, we had a really big warm up. It was like 70 degrees out in January. And then we got snow again after that. So we'll get a couple feet of snow usually most winters, one to two feet on the ground at, at one point. And we'll get so, more than that over the Tina, season. Do you like to make oxtail or you happen to have an oxtail that showed up in a batch of meat mm -hmm. that you need to figure out what to do with it? <laughs> That's a question. Oxtail soup is kind of a, you know, using that. As a... And Carrie, that is funny. A friend left the dough to rise when she broke her foot. Uh, not funny that she broke her foot. Hubby was out of state. She went 
into surgery for a while, came back, and the dough had spread all over the counter and falling onto the ground. That is some happy yeast. That sounds pretty, yeah, that sounds like what would happen. <laughs> it's kind of, how do you break your foot while uh, kneading dough? I guess she went to another. Well, she was <laughs> letting it rise when okay. she broke her foot. Right. So she was obviously doing something else. Probably, guessing... <laughs> it was probably molding also, but. Yeah, depending on how long she was I in the I think the best bread, traditional bread, where bakers can do it, is like a three-day. Yeah. You, you do a two-day ferment, so you're really not adding any yeast to it. You have a little bit of yeast in it, and you let that propagate. Uh, and so it's uh, two to three days, uh, which is just really kind of impossible to do at home unless you're really focused on bread as a major part of your yeah. activities every week. I don't know. Stefan might do that style. Yeah, uh, but that's that's. Okay. If you guys ever want, he's a great guy to follow on um, Instagram. He's doing all kinds of stuff right now. He's got, yeah, food-wise, he's got a lot of things going on He grew Instagram. up in the country in France, Yeah. so he learned a lot of the traditional country food and a lot of the handling, a lot of the meat and such. Well, hi, he likes. Um, and other, you know, pastries, uh, but all country stuff. But he does a lot of other things, too. He's yeah. been cooking like crazy. Uh, yeah, I'd have to look up. I think it's like Stefan B and then a number 64 yeah. or something. One of the best things you yeah. can do is just kind of keeping a little easy as a pre-ferment. If you're running a sourdough, that when you make dough, you take out a portion of it, you know, a handful of it. And if you're going to make dough in the next two or, you know, two days or so, you just leave it in a cool place. Uh, we used to take some of the dough and throw it in a container, cover it with a towel, and throw it under the under the counter overnight, and that was the start point for the next day. Mm -hmm. um, but then you would, um, um, but you could, if you're not going to make dough for a while, you could take that dough ball, and you can throw it in, um, you can throw it in the refrigerator, and then when you start with the next one, you can take that, put it in, and you hydrate it and get it wet and soft. And then you add in your other ingredients around it, have to adjust your water oh, content, wait. and it become and that becomes a pre-ferment. You guys on Instagram, Stefan B74. I'll type it in, but he's got a big thing of sourdough rye posted right there that just popped up first thing. He's always making something. All this stuff is looks amazing. He's um, we've met him a couple times. Yeah, he, he was at the Hoot Nanny and. Uh, was there even one other? Maybe that's the first time we met him. The first time I met him, yeah. he's pretty active on the Pratt uh, channel, Pratt family. Yeah. Um, I actually it was funny because I him always that we sent you. <laughs> I always read it fast and hadn't met him. I always thought it was Stephanie because I never was paying any attention. Yeah, uh, I but, think Mike Pratt did that too. Yeah, but he's a uh, French guy with a traditional name, Stefan. So um, it's not it's a the, just the French version of yes, Stephen. Yes, so Stefan. Yeah. Um, so he, yeah, he works to some degree somewhat professionally in food and some food consultation, although uh, he really does stuff on more of a corporate level and is not a, not a trained chef, but he's definitely experienced uh, yeah. and makes really nice stuff. Yeah. He's, he's, he, I would love to be, go over to the his The writing wall was broken through. Wow. The yikes. I yeah. just heard about a, I have, um, an acquaintance friend who. Uh, I understand got killed on his tractor. Uh, I just found out it was a year or two ago. Yeah. That had a, um, I think they were trying to, best I could figure out, they were trying to jump it, I think. And I think it lurched for, it was in gear or something. And when it started with the jump, it lurched forward and, and probably threw him off and, and crushed him. Um, as best I can figure, it's a little, a little vague because they didn't, yeah. but it was sort of a very, very tragic, unexpected uh, um, uh, yeah, thing for him. you got to be careful. Really yeah, careful take your tractor out of gear when you uh, jump it. Not just that. Be careful on what angle you're on and everything. I've had him, uh, hurt. I actually had a middle school math teacher who had his tractor roll over on him. That's one of the most common farm accidents and kid farm accidents is tractor related. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they've started building them better and better for rollovers and things, but I know that is one of an unsuspected but, but a go, high, high a level of, of severe injury. A lot of homesteaders go and get the antique ones, which is awesome. I love the antique tractors, but you got to be careful with them. That's actually been there's been there's been talk um, and articles about uh, with a resurgence because we go through generational lags in agriculture and we're in a resurgence of moving back to the of, land of uh, food and land and and people doing small ag. But you have a lot of people that did not come from a tradition <clears throat> of it, and so you are—they are noting a lot more farm accidents 
on small farms and upstart start farms because people accidentally did things they just didn't realize were dangerous. Yeah. Or they're working with equipment that's not optimal, you know, things like that. Or that they haven't been using very long. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, I should get on to our forge food of the week. So it's one of my favorites, actually. Um, I could. It's only available this time of year in Michigan, uh, but okay. Um, it, these are little saplings, but these are papa plants. We planted these this summer and. I uh, had a friend who had some, so these hopefully will grow up and start uh, doing well for us. But these are pawpaws, and pawpaws are found <clears throat> all over the eastern half of the United States. Um, there's some traditions with uh, picking pawpaws and festivals and stuff in the south, not as much in the north, but you can find them all the way north to southern Michigan, so we're at the very northern well, range. We live five miles from Pawpaw, Michigan. We do live very close to Pawpaw, Michigan. So and there are pawpaws in Pawpaw. There are, but there. What was their tree that they picked? <sighs> there, well, yeah, we. I, okay. If you drive into town, it's the official tree is there a tree city USA, and the maple tree is their official tree. Which but they're called Pawpaw. God, they had yeah. some stupid people. So this is a forgotten plant. <laughs> yeah. Obviously. I don't know when that happened, but they need to change that. <laughs> yeah, right. Someone needs to tell them what their city is named after. But it is um, an awesome plant that create, it, that grows a really cool fruit. Um, it's like a, basically the closest relatives. It's in the custard family, uh, custard apple, apple family. So its closest relatives are all tropical. And this is a strange one in that family because it has to have a season, like a couple months under <clears throat> 40 degrees or under for those seeds to germinate. So you need actually um, that cold weather for this one to even survive. So you won't find it in the extreme south, like at, in Florida or whatnot, but um, it is a cool plant. It's got a fun flower. It's, hardly noticeable it's this darker color uh red or winish color um it can turn brown it starts as it actually starts green so it kind of blends in uh i just happened to catch this one i can't remember if it was may or june but at the permaculture class i was going to um their property it was in bloom while we were there and got a good picture of it uh so that was at lily house kalamazoo if you guys want to check that out they have a good facebook page also with lots of information but the actual fruit is this kind of oblong uh green fruit that's got a softer inner part of it hardly anything will eat this when it's not ripe and hardly anything will eat it when it is ripe as far as bugs go uh it's Animal, actually the animals will take them though Animals will take them, uh, <coughs> but it's usually it once it's ripe only yeah. because as the plant otherwise inedible. It's only the fruit when it's ripe that is edible. Um, it's got an awesome custard apple, apple type center to it. Uh, if you guys have ever had those, the tree itself is, you know, well, I guess you could call it a large shrub or a small tree, but it can grow up to about 40 feet. Yeah, many times they look more like a bush, but then they, they get big. Yeah. I mean, it's a tall. It would be a tall shrub. <clears throat> or tall, bushy yeah, shrub. Yeah. A lot of times they're only around 10 feet tall or something. They grow in moist areas. Uh, so they do. And by the way, I'm glancing at my website here. Down below is the website. And I post. Uh, information on these forged items every week you can always check out or go through past ones but um, but yeah they grow basically usually close to water in some uh, wetter areas but not necessarily right next to the water um, they like to grow in the shade they are an understory plant although they will uh, provide more fruit if they get some sun so as young plants they really like the shade but if we're thinning out our trees in front right now our pawpaws we planted them in the shade on the edge of our property in a bunch of leaf mulch to hopefully hold more water there but if we're thinning out our trees in front they will be getting more sun down the road which is kind of part of our plan in our food forest so we change over some of them 
Um, so the harvest is pretty much right now, you don't want to harvest them early. Because if you harvest them too early, they will not ripen off the vine. So how do you know they're ripe? You basically shake the tree and they fall off. You know they're ripe. So pick them up and take them home. Or at least very close to ripe. So some people eat them while they're still green, like in this picture. That's about right to start eating them. To get starting to get some darker spots. They should, yeah, they should yield um, sort of like a pear. At, um, Just a little bit. Yep. They, they still are firm, but they might yield. Otherwise, they're really starchy, and there's some yeah. potential there are toxins, some toxins when they're less ripe. Yeah. Uh, and then you can eat them all the way until they're black almost, So and they get sweeter as they start turning dark. Um, and they get more. And they get softer. They get, so they get really extreme, complex flavors when they yeah. get very soft. Um, and I like them better. A little bit earlier stage they're a little more firm and just texture wise I like them better but you can take them yeah. all the way to uh, they'll be a lot sweeter when so they can it. have texture somewhere in the banana ish and yep. they can have banana and pineapple and tropical flavors it uh, tastes really tropical for something that's not yeah um, shockingly uh, tropical for our area that you would think it definitely got imported from a very hot equatorial area yeah so you can eat these things uh by just slicing them and eating taking a spoon and scooping it out um you can make pudding out of it you could make bread with it ice cream custard and i did link another web page uh that has it's actually michigan radio had a recipe for pop yeah, just this week i was driving around and i heard i think it's called what is it something state it's a weekly Michigan based Michigan radio ra um, program. So the public that. radio station. Yeah, but this is a, a, a Michigan produced thing. Right. And so they do regular recipes where they're challenged to use native items. Huh. And they when it, right when I turned it on, they were discussing what to do with the pawpaw. And they were challenged to do something with a pawpaw and make a drink, a mixed drink. So they had a professional bartender who created a pawpaw colada. Uh, using the pulp as part of the puree to flavor it, and uh, they said it was very good. I haven't tried it, um, yeah. but they were describing it on the radio. That's as close as we got. Green Gables asked, do you have to wait for the first frost to nope. get pawpaws? Nope, they're available. Um, they start ripening up in September, so I before. think they probably black then fall off on the first frost. I don't, they might. I think they may kind of be overshot at that point, um, but they should be off the trees by then. Yeah, so, or, or close to being done by Pawpaws them. are available. They start, I started seeing them in the farmer's market about a week ago, yep. a week and, maybe two weeks ago. At Last most. year, I think they were a little bit earlier because we were harvest, we went out in September foraging. So if you, actually, if you find our video from about a year ago, foraging with Nobby, pawpaws and mushrooms, um, you could go watch that video and it talks about how to identify the tree a little bit and a whole bunch of foraging things in that video so you can watch that if you yeah, like. Yeah, it was a pretty good harvest last year. Um, yes. They kind of go up and down year to year. This year I think it's okay. Um, the ones we have one here, I, I actually bought two um, from Bon Amigo. Yeah, um, we have one. at the market. This is on the large size for what we get in the wild. I know there's a variety of sizes. This is this is a little bit large. This is like a large prickly pear yeah. um, size. Yeah. So I would say, yeah, this is on the large size for what we had last year. This yeah. is like a medium potato. Yeah. And there are big, big black seeds in it that you in have to. Yeah. Work so we'll around. cut this open for you and show you, but then we'll have to eat it right away. Um, so they are really good. So they say they fed them to kids and when they didn't, in place of bananas. Of course, bananas yeah. were rare. Bananas, interestingly, you know, there's a whole story with bananas going on. The banana we eat today, which I believe is a Cavendish banana, only became popular, I want to say, in the 60s. The other types of bananas um, died out, through, and so they were softer and much richer in flavor. Mm -hmm. um, the Cavendish banana has replaced it because it was nearly disease-resistant. It's a much larger, and it has to go through this ripening process and has this thicker texture and it's flavorful but not as flavorful as these old style bananas yeah now the current cavendish which is so inexpensive and available is also probably going to be eradicated for the most part in the next 10 to 15 years they're having uh, disease has crept up and killing out large portions around the world 
Um, yeah. So there is a, a fight to find ways other bananas because that is such a cheap item. So uh, other banana, there are other bananas, some of those old style ones, but they are you know, in, in isolation do just fine. And you can get them through specialty places, but um, they're looking at some new ones that, yeah, are, Creek, that will probably become more expensive. They'll probably be a richer flavor, a little bit more like the old style ones. Yeah. And um, Japanese have a cold hardy one that's supposed to taste more like the old style one. That would be cool if you could get a cold hardy one here. Well, there is one. Uh, it's five hundred dollars for banana plant right now. <laughs> Lovely. And that's they're selling happening. them at five or six dollars a banana. So that's in Japan. I don't know if your market can handle it, yeah. but. It's possible, and it's supposed to be a really rich, amazingly flavored banana. Yeah. So you might be able to pay off your inv investment, but I don't. And and you got to get that thing to grow up and and you know not and produce. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So anyway, going back to the pawpaws from the bananas, um, you do. There's all, actually in the skin and in the leaves. The reason they're inedible. There's a lot of alkaloids in them. So you got to watch that in the seeds as well. So you don't eat the seeds. Um, there's some medicinal and nutritional value to this. Uh, the fruit contain 5% protein, which is very high for fruit and about 15% carbohydrates, about 1% fat. And it has a lot of vitamin A and vitamin C in it. Um, papas also have been shown to have some a whole variety of health benefits so anywhere from anti-cancer to anti-inflammatory which could go together actually anti-convulsant are you softening it i'm not squeezing it <laughs> um no <laughs> um anti-parasitic and they use it for treating malaria uh and as well as uh one of the better fruits for diabetics um Interesting note is that Native Americans use the seeds, which have the alco alkaloids, to stun fish so that they could catch them easier. They also did that with buckeye seeds. Um, they also use the inner bark fibers to make clothing. And, of course, uh, the leaves and can be made into an in insecticide as well. Um, this thing is definitely ripe because it is starting to attract fruit flies, which is kind of interesting because it's not supposed to, but I think it's because it cut on the top. Yeah. Uh, the skin, actually, most bugs will not eat through the skin of it. So, anyway, save the seeds. In five years, you can have pop. No, actually, save this. Yeah, in five years, you can have pop up trees ma mature. But what you do with the seeds? If you get a pawpaw plant, you get the seeds, you have to get them cold. So I would put them in, and they have to stay moist. So some people will actually save the skin and wrap the seeds in the skin and put them in the fridge. You could also put them in peat moss in the fridge. You got to keep them damp though. Um, and then keep them in there. It has to be 40 degrees for a few months. And then you can plant them. They do best planting them direct seed, I heard rather than potting because their roots are very sensitive to transplant. So I did transplant those little saplings that I showed you a picture of. Um, the other thing they're is, surviving I them. was told by Mike um, Hogue that if you don't get them from seed to moist and chilled immediately, immediately. Within, within a couple of hours, you can lose 90% uh, effect uh, viability on them. Uh, so if you don't handle them intentionally and immediately, you might as well just throw them away. And here's another thing if you want to try to cultivate pawpaws is that they will, if you get one plant to grow, it will spread through its root system and it'll grow. But you will not get any fruit off those plants because you need something with different genetics. So you need another plant to grow separately, not a shoot off the roots because if they're, if they're growing by runners, then they're genetically identical. So you do need two different um uh varieties or different genetics to be able to have fruit um another thing i learned from my co at lily house was that some people will actually um uh, i'm blinking on the name what do you do with apple trees when you put the branch on them graft graft them graft a branch from a different type onto it and then you'll have two types on one tree and then it'll suddenly start producing fruit so kind of cool um, yeah, <laughs> Brown said, I, I missed, uh, Brown said, Brown Coat Homestead. I'm sorry. I'm exhausted. Um, I did miss that message that went up that you 
took right back down. So, uh, okay. Anyway, just making sure to see if we missed anything here. So you guys want to see what the inside of this looked like. If for those of you guys who haven't seen a pop-up before, do you want to cut it open? Yeah, because you're abusing it. It's I'm not, not gonna last. abuse. I'm not squeezing it. Go back and watch the video. I'm holding it, but I'm not squeezing it. I was very careful. Anyway, I'm gonna get teased by that about that now. So there are a number of seeds yeah, in here. See you gotta put your screens down. Okay. So there are a number of seeds in here. Yeah, there's a big delay on this. Um, they are big seeds. Let's see if I can pull one out here for you. Um, keep the pulp around it if you want to save the seed. Don't wash them off. But they are pretty darn big seeds here. Um, yeah. And they're tasty. <laughs> so this is fairly soft on the inside. It's not horribly soft still got a firmness oh, to it pretty. but it's actually it's soft it's softer than a pretty ripe. it's a very ripe banana or softer yeah it yeah. would be like a very ripe mango yeah it would and it it's actually very has similar a, i mean not a, a very has similar flavors to a mango also because some yeah between a mango a banana a pineapple and it's got like it's just got this just topical, topical flavor mm -hmm. to it so uh, to get in the it does have some terpenes like a mango, you know, that astringent bitterness. No. And it does have a sort of a custardy so, flavor that really oh, develops that. when it gets really old. We had some last year that went a little too far. Mm -hmm. um, it actually starts tasting like butterscotch. Like I'm trying mango to show you the seed. butterscotch. Excuse me as I spit out a seed. Yeah. Well. So anyway, so that yeah, is very sl slippery, hard to hold. Anyway. Those you can save, keep a I little bit of pulp around it. This is the beginning of, of ready to eat. I yeah, mean, this is where on. I like it. Actually, I had some at the um, at my permaculture class this weekend. It's very good. So as we eat in front of you guys, sorry about that. It is a big seed. Um, it's actually very similar to the cocoa bean seed, the cocoa beans. Basically, uh, we had when we went to Trinidad. Uh, we went hiking and you get these cocoa pods that are just a little bit bigger than this, maybe one and a half times the size of that. And you cut it in half and there's these beans in it. And the funny thing is the pith of the cocoa you can eat the, around the beans tastes like grapefruit. Like grapefruit. Yep. It was really good. Yeah, this also it. has some almost coconutty or white chocolatey flavor. When you talk about you know, kind of even professionally breaking down the flavors. It's so complex. There are so many even primary flavors, and when you yeah. get into the nuances, or you start doing a, if you start doing a, um, chemical, you know, breakdown of the flavors, it would just be, it's a huge pool of things. Yep. So sorry, we are going to eat in front of you tonight because you can't break these open without eating them. But um. Yeah, I only have two right now that I yeah. got. Um, I'll, I'll probably get more. Yeah, I'm sure Nabi will bring in more. Yeah. But, yeah. I, I I bought some and uh, just because I saw them out there and they were really big ones and so I I grabbed those um, while they were there. Sometimes they go fast. Pop buzz have really had a resurgence around here and I think even I've seen more articles. Yeah. Um, where before you hardly ever saw it. I think it's um, nationally getting a resurgence that and it was almost lost. Even in the area where they grow pretty, they grow very well around here. You have very few people that have eaten them. Yeah, um, they're just starting they to come hear back about to them. them. They're starting to come back to the market, so it's well, they don't yeah. travel well, so no. you would only really find it at like farmers markets around here. They used to be shipped around. They used to be a commercial product, um, but it's been a long time. Actually, there were so many of them when people didn't have tropical fruit. Right they used to give them to kids instead of bananas, and they were so prevalent. I think it was sort of like kiwis and and uh, tropical areas where they just grow out of control and nobody wants them because it's like they're all forced to eat them when they're a kid. Now they're just rare because they're not propagated and, and handled. So that's. Oh, I think part of that, I think part of that is that if you try to collect them early, they don't ripen well. Well, you can't go, yeah, you can't go weeks in, in advance and cold store them. But yeah. they can, we handle all kinds of other things that if they wanted to handle them, they, probably they could. could easily uh, set up a system. Yeah. Um, but no, it's, it's 
definitely one of my favorite fruits. Now, there are different varieties. The one that I had at, like, Hoke's Place had at the Lily House was a little bit sweeter than this one. Um, so it just depends, I think, a little bit on the cultivar because they are starting to cultivate them and sell them as well at some specialty greenhouses and, you know, nurseries. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's, um, so you might be able to find ones to buy, but they do have trouble transplanting. So I would just ask about that if you find them at a nursery. Um, yeah. Green Gables, what, what variety of garlic? Do you get a hard neck or a soft neck or... Anybody give you any hints on what they like to grow? Because that's yeah. that's the most important thing at a farmer's market, whether they do. Well, so, they went to the locals' farm. Yeah, whether they do so yeah. purposefully or accidentally, they can pretty much give you all your problem solving and what you need to know. Yeah, yeah. You can also ask them if you know how they, you know, what care they need or what not, what timing exactly to put it in the ground and all that. But um, we don't put ours in the ground for probably the end of this month. Yeah. To early next month. Anytime before, while the before it gets really still, cold, you know, still pliable and yeah. able to get it in there. Before we get a lot of snow, yeah. basically. But they could go in anytime. Probably it's a little touch, touch early. Want to get a little bit cooler, yeah. but it's fine. Yeah, and I actually left some of mine in the ground from harvesting, and they're already growing back. So <laughs> I'm a big fan of hard neck. Like I said, uh, I think the German or the Italian hard neck garlic is vastly superior to the soft neck multi-clove sale like grown in california that just happens to grow in the warm weather and grow very well in california it doesn't mean it's the best tasting it's just yeah. easy to propagate uh, i find hard neck is and there are lots of different flavors and varieties of garlic like i said there's a woman in our market that sells probably 20 different types of garlic she really only sells some herbs in the summer and some lavender and stuff and she sells primarily garlic um in the fall that's her that's her main crop. That's her main crop. And and she doesn't she sells them like three dollars a head. They are not cheap. But she does a lot of specialty items. Um and I yeah, I really do enjoy the uh, hard neck garlics. I think they're excellent flavor. Yeah, and Willow Creek definitely get to your farmers market. It's the best way to learn about the local farmers. Frequently it's one of the cheapest ways in season to purchase product. Yeah. Um especially vegetables if, for things that you don't possibly produce yourself. Yeah. Because uh, there's such an excess, they go at very low rates. They're usually very fresh, different varieties are ripe. Yeah. So, and, and then you get, get to know your favorite farmers. Yeah. Our market's really good. Um, different markets have different personalities and different yeah. standards. Some, anybody can roll in there and do anything. Our market is sort of a mix. We have, uh, in fact, there's one market up towards Holland. I think it's called the 100 Mile Market. Everything has to be organic and everything has to be within 100 miles. Yeah. And that's, I haven't been there, but that is intensely the, tight the standards. Market in Austin, where we lived in New York, um, it had to be within 80 miles. Yeah, and 50 to 80 miles yeah. is kind of a good, I mean, some people define local up to 200 miles, 250 yeah. miles, or all the touching states. But, um, and that's not so important. Um, but the, our market is good because they actually identify each stall as a grower, a producer, an artisan, or yeah. a retailer and so it tells you who you're buying from so a retailer can just be buying at a commodity market and trucking in and reselling product it. yeah uh, and that's and they've decided that's okay but you need to know what it is so they'll yeah. have strawberries and raspberries at this time times. of year they'll have peaches and things that are going out of season and cherries uh, and they usually say where they're from and they also have a lot of local product um, where possible because uh, it makes the most sense but then uh, a producer has to grow 80%. In, our, in my market that we go to, 80% of it has to come from their land. Uh, you can do some trading uh, mm -hmm. with other local farms. And then you can have 20% uh, when identified properly can, can come from other areas. I'm an artisan. Um, I'm a producer, which means um, I make product. with. I don't grow the product, but I secondarily handle and make the product. An artisan could it does the same type of thing, but they're not food usually. Yeah. It would be jewelry or soaps or lotions or clothing or anything that is a non-edible. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Well, that's good. Yeah. Well, Creek, there are some areas around here that uh, some of the grocery stores will have some more Almost local all stuff. Oh, so they're doing a lot. Um, yeah. Now, what it is, and, and a local food is good because it's riper. It can be off of a thousand acre commercial farm, and that's that's all right, too, just, cause, just being local. 
in New York, we had a lot of Jersey, you know, Jersey corn, tomatoes, New York, and they're uh, melons, zucchinis, and they'd have a whole local bulkhead, but they're coming off a multi-thousand acre conventional farms, uh, but they were still a local economy. Yeah. <clears throat> and then some grocery stores are really good about working with medium-sized farms and or bringing in specialty items. Uh, so there's lots of ways to do it. Another good way is you can sometimes you can get CSAs that'll be drop-offs to your house or drop-offs to a central point or you a store. You gotta watch some of them though, because some of them are bringing them in from all over the place. Like yeah. my sister CSA who dropped off bananas. I'm like, that's not local. That's not a CSA. <laughs> that is that's a they uh, called that's it a, a CSA. <laughs> yeah, community supported agriculture should yeah. come from your community yeah. only. Uh, a co-op, you are cooperatively purchasing the things that you need, and they could be anything. So. Yeah, well, Creek, if you want to make soap, what I would do is definitely try to get somehow get to your local farmer's market and see who's already doing Lots it. Lots of people making soap uh, um, right now. Our farmer's market has, well, we have a big yeah, farmer's market. I don't know. Three or four, I want yeah, to say, there's, soap makers. There's so many. And there's a whole lot of different styles from vegan soap, which I didn't know was even a thing, but they don't use any animal products. Because a lot of people use uh, tallow, you yeah. know, and which sure. makes actually very good soap. Yeah. Um, animal fats and and then blended fats and some do all natural and some do uh, scented with all kinds of different things. Yeah. We we don't make soap. No. Uh, we have 1870s Homestead. I think is was making, making a little soap. soap. They just started this year. Um, on that project, um, Rachel was just starting. Who's to oh uh, once again makes a ton of soap. Been making soap and selling it for years. Um, Holler Homestead. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's course. been selling at markets uh, quite a bit. So a lot of people are doing it. We've never really made it. We feel like um, it, we've got other things to fill our time. And if we really need uh, something time. like that, we, we would rather purchase that item. Yeah. Uh, but it can be done. The one thing you have to be careful, the lye uh, or is very caustic. Yeah. So handling that properly, keeping away from the kids, the pets. And typically the measuring cups. And a lot of people <laughs> use crock pots, old crock pots. Yeah, no vegan milk. soap here. <laughs> well, actually, yeah. Um, the, a lot of goat the milk person soap here. next to me on the Thursday market yeah. makes goat milk soap, and she used to have a lot of her own goats. Now she purchases the milk. I like so it's soap. an add-in um, to the soap, and she uses a coconut, olive oil, and canola blend. I think it is. Uh, there's a you know she uses so she uses um, because she's buying it. But traditionally, if you were, you know, that hard fat, if you have beef, the hard tallow fat's only good for certain things. You don't eat a lot of it. You can fry in it and it makes excellent French fries, but if you're not using it as a fryer, so if you're, using you're the making, whole animal. You're making um, lamp, you know, you're either running lamps with yeah. it or you're making soap or you're throwing it away. Yeah. So, you so. know, see, we've never had holler soap. I just know she's been doing it a long time. She's supposed yeah. to be quite good. We got to, we got to meet the Met Hoot Nanny and they're yeah. an awesome couple. Um, but and yeah, actually, do be careful with yeah. the chemicals where you store them. A lot of people use like a cheap, um, a cheap crock pot to warm, um, warm the items, and so they isolate all those things and they label. And that's all soap making equipment because a lot of them stuff looks like um, uh, looks like measure, you know, looks like uh, kitchen equipment. In fact, somebody was telling me that they had a cup that they measured things like a steel cup or something. And her husband went and poured it. She washes it. So some people are very specific. Like Keep it nothing separate. ever touches it. I don't know. It seems like if you washed it, although the lye is very strong. Yeah. Uh, so careful. he had a cup of he had a cup of coffee with her lye cup, but uh, it was well clean. <laughs> but it could become a medical thing. So just yeah. be very careful uh, handling that step and yeah. uh, where you use the equipment. Plus, it can stain and eat things. So you want to be careful. What, what you're doing it on. Yeah. Like not your nice new countertop. Um yeah, so Creek, yeah, I get that. I work full time, so my videos come out one, two, three a week and then the live show. So I wish I could do more. It would be fun. I wish I could get in my garden more. That would be fun too, because I have so many things that I haven't harvested because just out of time. Um Okay. Yeah, no, she hasn't been selling her soap all over the road. There's a ton of videos on making soap. Oh, yeah, uh, all over the place. More than you can handle. It's probably like cooking videos and cooking knowledge. Probably half of it's junk or even bad videos, you know, bad yeah, information. Yeah. But with a little, you know, you watch enough videos, you figure out What's who's good. doing it smart. And, and so, uh, yeah. So, yeah. 
Yeah, and I'm sure Meg Mag isn't making any soap right now. Cause are you really... going? Are you guys going over to um, Homesteaders of America? Actually, is anyone going to Homesteaders of America in the room? I have a couple questions related. I was asking Willow Creek primarily, but anybody planning on going? And I know there's a delay on the chat, so a delay on the video, I should say. Um, so we will be there. In fact, uh, we are giving a discount on your business, <clears throat> which is pasta, for another week. Uh, if you order it by next week, Sunday night, uh, midnight, then you can get 15% off by using HOA 2018. So if anyone... There are no bad videos on YouTube yet, sure. <laughs> <laughs> there are no bad recipes either. <laughs> <laughs> but I was going to say for Willow Creek, if you're going to um, Homesteaders America, they always have someone demoing soap making there too and all that. So I'm sure they have someone this year. I'd be really surprised if they don't. But I haven't looked at the whole schedule completely yet. So Willow Creek is is yes. going to Homesteaders. Brown coats, yes, yes, is that yes, they're yes. going to Brown coats? Yeah, they won the tickets on Pratt. Okay. No, no, you didn't win the tickets. I'm sorry, Browns, you won the ticket somewhere else, and have an extra ticket, right? You need to find someone to give the ticket to and to find a ride from the airport. You're the one I was talking to about that, right? Get it? Um, Brown Coat Home said, if I'm got this right and the right person, you're the one who's flying in Thursday morning to Dulles and needs a ride. Oh, that's a little, little bit of a distance. It's yeah. about an hour, um, I want to say. Is it only so, an hour? Yeah. Yeah, I want to say it's just about an hour, maybe a little over. But if anyone else is flying in and renting a car, then it would be Oh, so they went with two family homestead. Okay. Yes. Yeah, we right. won tickets through the Pratts last year. And that's we why did. we, I don't know if we would have gone necessarily. We might have thought about it. But when we won the tickets, we're like, all right, let's we're go. Go. We're going. I had just finished my job up um, at the beginning of September. So it opened up my weekends other than yeah. we missed a market week. Uh, yeah. But it gave us the opportunity. So we went be because of the free tickets yeah. and are going back this year. So, yeah, so we're going back this year. This time we didn't win tickets. We went ahead and purchased them early. Um, but, um, yeah, so Brown Coat Homestead, if anybody's going and will be there Thursday morning and could give them a ride, that would be awesome. Or if anyone's flying in, that would probably be awesome for them, too. I've seen some of the recipe archaeology videos. They're pretty funny. But yeah. they're intentionally disgusting, I think, <laughs> uh, some of them. Not so much that they're performing them badly as they're just... Picking on things that are kind of They're taking weird. these old things and like, let's try... Yeah, they're, like, they're pretty they're picking funny. Picking the weirdest things they could find or something. Yep. But, um, okay. So, anyway, if any of you guys would like to uh, uh, buy any pasta for us to bring to Homesteaders of America, you can actually pick on our webpage the option for pick up at the farmer's market. I uh, have slash... Uh, or prearranged site. So if you pick that option, there's no shipping. We'll just bring it to you. And if you're going to Homesteaders of America, we'll just bring it along with us, pack it in the car if you guys want. And um, I'll put the web page down here if you guys want any of it. Uh, so I can't type and talk at the same time. And the you could get 15% off and still have it shipped to you if you use this code, the HOA 2018 code. It, we're just letting people know in this YouTube com uh, community and um, and the uh, basically the homesteader friends. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's not, we don't have any gluten-free uh, types if you have any gluten issues and things. So, um, but we can bring any of our dried pasta which is all we have available online at this point. So, yeah, yeah, totally. and we have recipes on that page too, by the way. Um, though, yeah, but I she's forgot, she talked about the other, yeah. yeah. Recipe archaeology where yeah. they're doing old school some weird. That's some weird kind of stuff. funny. Yeah. Um, no, but if you if you do gluten free or something else, if you guys want uh recipe ideas for pasta, we keep posting new recipes. On there and you can use it yeah whatever. i think we saw their video where they did the ham and broiled or baked banana recipe from like the 1950s or 60s and it had like deli ham um like pressed deli ham and bananas and i think it had like a hollandaise or a bechamel over it huh yeah that was 
Sounds terrible. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> I'm not, I don't mind bananas, but they're not my favorite thing. Uh, so <laughs> putting ham and bananas together just kills it. Yeah. Well, Willow Creek, Mike's played around with some recipes that are gluten-free. It's just not there yet. Um, and been distracted by other projects. Yeah, I have tons of people asking for gluten-free. I could totally make a lot of money uh, running some gluten-free. I'm just trying to optimize it. But part of it is getting getting the ingredients in bulk from the right sources to bring yeah. the cost down because I don't want to work with the blend. The blends are way overpriced. I want to cut the middle out of that and I want to have control over my blend. Yeah. Uh, so I've mostly been working with chickpea based or uh, you know legume bean based uh, pastas because I like the chew and the higher protein. Um, and I think it tastes pretty good. But um, uh, so that's where I'm working. But I'm, I'm working on sourcing and I'm working on optimizing, and I'm having issues with drying. So I may yeah. start it as fresh first and then move to... Which means we can't sell yeah. it. Well, it, it would be very difficult to ship it to people without it being horribly expensive. So. Well, if it was fresh, it would yeah. be, yeah. And then I'd have to put it in a overnight on an ice pack. So it's, you know, you're shipping shipping 60 or $70, and then you got product in it. Yeah. Uh, so that's, yeah, so that's it. Uh, Jello molds. Jello molds are amazing, by the way. Jello molds are a great expression of making a terrine. Oh, right. Yeah, actually, so if they're from. performed, which is very classical. Yeah, it's very classical, and they did all kinds of things. And if you construct them properly, they're actually pretty good. Yeah. Um, but you got to do the right things to Jello. There's some really nasty stuff. Uh, and some people just don't like Jello because of texture. the texture or the circumstances and sort of oh, connotations of Jello and where they, you know, it has to do with hospital or school. No, it has to do with their, they always were oh, fed right, it right. in hospitals or yeah, schools yeah, yeah, yeah. or things. Um, but some of it is the texture of it being kind of soft and slippery, but that's actually the beauty of it. And you can do some really amazing things um, that are creative with Jello. So I'm, I'm kind of a fan of the Jello mold, or, or packing, you know, doing layers of things. I don't do it often, but I think people have given it a bad rep. Yeah, especially hospitals, probably. I you know my challenge with the gluten-free flour is so there's a couple different ways. So you use them for different things. I need to have something in the pizza crust style that's going to be a very stretchy, hard, um, so that you get a chew from the pasta. But I also work very wet. And so my extrusion very dry. I mean, sorry, very uh, very dry. So my extrusion technology needs to be able to handle the product and press it out properly. So that makes it even harder than just being a standard. Yeah. Um, like you couldn't do a rice noodle because it's just too sticky. It wouldn't Jello mold with fruit cocktail and marshmallows. That's not the worst thing. You got to start adding cottage cheese and cabbage to it. <laughs> then it gets good. <laughs> when you've got shaved cabbage and cottage cheese mixed Jello in. Along with canned fruit, some form of Jello, and you got to have marshmallows. Now you're talking Midwest. Yeah, it is very Midwest. Yeah, that's uh, and and I've never had it with cottage cheese, although that's my, one of my my mom would favorite make things. it occasionally. Um, so, like lime Jello and cottage cheese or Ooh. citrus. We it's, did do lime. It's not as bad as you would think, but it's yeah, you can get some wild. I'm not a fan of the cabbage, the shredded cabbage in there, but um, that yeah, shows no. up. Uh, the other probably the only way to get the kids to eat vegetables. <laughs> well, the other thing you can think about, so terrines and things started with uh, boiling down and making marmites and double stocks and triple stocks um, so that you would glaze so things. So it would be made typically with beef, uh, with beef or pork bones, knuckles, and it would be like a meat glaze. And so you would actually embed, say, shredded or pulled meat or confit in it. And so you have meat-related terrines that are gelatinized are uh, packed in gelatin and and um and that goes very old school classical uh totally different than your fruit based um gelatins yeah and by the way you can use agar agar which is pretty expensive compared to gelatin but agar agar will work almost exactly the same yeah. if you follow the right ratios and you can which is seaweed. and you can get around any of the any of the meat based the items vegan. if you need to yeah um <laughs> <laughs> you want us to stop talking about Jello? <laughs> um, yeah, my mom. <laughs> she knows. She knows those recipes with the. Uh, yeah, it was I so mean, 1950s, but it's also it so is Midwest. very 50s, 60s, but it's also very Midwest because there's things that we had at like family picnics, and especially over my dad's side, which they had more people from this area. 
Uh, and we've kind of moved. We grew up on the east side of the state. We're on the west side now. Some of those things that I thought were just kind of a family thing or had disappeared, they haven't disappeared. Mm -hmm. I mean, the relish trays, of course, the crudite, the, je the jello <laughs> salads, uh, um, it's all still here. And so I I, I, met, I I didn't realize it was regional food, but it is a regional and cultural yeah. um, I and don't mind, food. I don't mind the ones, if it doesn't have cottage cheese or cabbage, I don't mind the dessert ones with the little fruit and grapes or something. Yeah, I actually kind of like the fruit ones. They're refreshing. Yeah. I don't mind marshmallows in general. So I'm not a big fan of the marshmallows in it. I don't know. You put it on top. Maybe we could brulee them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we're having, uh, I have a bunch of videos to get together too. So it's just going to come out slowly. One or two or three a week is my kind of pace yeah. too. So I understand the being behind on editing thing and trying to figure out, okay, which ones did I do? Or for that matter, which folder is it downloaded into? And try to find which date. Cause I'm bad about sorting as I download. It's all by date. So if I don't do it right away, I gotta go find that footage. I think it would be a good, um, actually, might be a good archive research project is start pulling up all the ver variations and like do a, a codification of uh, fruit jello activities. That that could and some of the monstrous displays that are available. I think that would be all the crazy uh, stuff. I think yeah. that could be pretty interesting. Um. Yeah, your mom said you brought you up right. <laughs> yeah, we we had a good amount of Jello um, growing up at times, so I don't think we dislike it uh, at all. I mean, you can also do the fun things we like just putting Jello. You can put Sprite and you know root beer and different things in and make it fit. So it's sort of like fizzy. the fizzy fruits now, where you can trap, where you can trap a little effervescence in it. Um, of course, some people put a little bit of alcohol in, but you need to be careful because that interacts with the gelatin. Yeah. So if you put too much alcohol in, uh, you need to use a lot more That's gelatin. That's a college It won't set up. That was a college Yeah, thing. I never really I didn't did never jello did. shots. No. And never, never saw quite the – it's basically covering up really cheap alcohol yeah. and, and, and uh, fruit. It just doesn't – yeah, never saw a lot to that. But you could use some creative things. Um, yep. So that would be uh, – yeah, I'm trying to think. There's some there's some really crazy stuff out there. Um with Jello and doing the different molds and the different angles and embedding things and Yeah. Jello cake, whipped cream on top. I'll tell you yeah. the one thing I really don't like is the jello style uh um key lime pies and the jello style cheesecakes, the quick mm. sets yeah. that use the gelatin. You're making it's actually called a Bavarian, by the way. It's not Jello is so Jello was working off of these classical gelatin and setting things up, but a Bavarian is when you make a a mousse. Uh, so a mousse is usually set up. You've got a hard part, and and it could be chocolate or it could be other solid parts, and then you've got um, fat like egg yolks or the chocolate and cream, and then you have thickeners. It could be egg whites and meringue uh, or gelatin, and so you make a mousse. But then um, you stir into that, or you could even do like a, um, a cooked custard, and then you stir into it aggressively warm gelatin, and then you quickly um, place it on, on a cake layer, whatever you're doing, and it sets up firm because of the gelatin. So you can no longer move it around like a traditional mousse. It's a sliceful mousse. That's called a Bavarian. Cool. So it's actually really useful and in cakes so people have used that to create the quick key lime pies and the quick cheesecakes but i always find them a little slippery slimy and not the texture of what i think of a cheesecake to be or a curd um so i i yeah. it's a it's a really quick way to pull it off it's a great home st home style trick and so i think the companies are um are wonderful that they've done it but i i think doing it the real way and taking the extra time gets a better product yeah Panna cotta I enjoy. I have an amazing panna cotta recipe, which panna cotta, by the way, can be terrible because um, <laughs> it can be just so gelatinous, so thick, and it's supposed to be almost like when your spoon hits it, it should almost fall apart. So panna cotta is a eggless custard, which actually makes it not a custard because custard requires that it have eggs and dairy. Uh, so, um, huh. 
put a jello. Yeah, I've seen yeah. that. I've seen those. That's interesting. Yeah, the jello in the cakes. That's interesting. Um, so you can. I don't do... know if I'd like the texture. I'm not... Yeah, it, it's okay. I've seen it. It's okay. I have to... I'm a texture person, so I have to have something. I mean, that's funny because I like the texture of the pawpaw. Now, if you took neutral gelatin and you like set it up with like root beer. Or that would be cool. Pep Coke <laughs> right. or Pepsi, it might in a chocolate cake. That might be kind of good. That might actually be good. Yeah. So panna cotta is an eggless custard. So it's a gelatin set, um, uh, dairy product, and um, so you got to be very subtle with it. Uh, otherwise, it's gross. But when it's pulled off correctly, it's very nice and it's light. It's also lighter in fat and lighter and um, and then you can actually go back. There's a co there's a white food or Mont Blanc, which kind of goes before that, which would have been ground up nuts, um, almonds using almonds or using um, using chestnuts. Um, well, that's a bit the chestnut a little different, and so you would use that nut milk to set it up through the proteins and the nuts, and that becomes huh. Mont Blanc or white food. Sounds wonderful, yeah. uh, which is impossible. I I made it once just to try and make it. Uh, and that's so, so old school. So then gelatin really replaced having to do these other things, setting them up using ground nuts, using bread. Uh, of course, you can set things with egg, uh, as in cooked custards. Uh, yeah. So so if you look at the history of all of it, gelatin makes a lot of sense and solves a lot of problems. Yeah. So it's pretty useful. Yeah. So, yeah, I know, Carrie, that Rose is sticking with that diet really pretty strict and well. I don't think I could do it. I I like my food. Cheesecake recipe. She's using because she can't have the flour, and she can't have dairy, but she's still having goat. I think she talked her doctor into letting her have goat milk. So she well, just talked about you don't goat have milk to do cheesecake. a cheesecake with a crust. You can just do a little crumb on the bottom or leave it alone. Um, and you could you can do a crustless or nearly crustless cheesecake. Yes. <laughs> I have some old, right. <laughs> yeah, I have old cookbooks from the 1900s um, church. I have some synagogue cookbooks, huh. um, same, you know, same type of, oh. from a variety of areas. And so people are using those, by the way, historically, professionally, they are, um, we're way over time. They're using way those over. because of, um, uh, because it's very historically origin based. Yeah. And so you can dig those recipes and possibly extract historical or anthropological information from those cookbooks. Sure. So they're pretty useful. Yeah. 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 No, she can't have sugar either. Um, but I, yeah, we should wrap up. We're way over our normal time. We've just kept going and going, but it's been fun. So we will be back next week on uh, Sunday at nine. Uh, the week after, we'll have to play it by ear because we'll be driving back from Homesteaders of America. Might be able to live stream briefly. We might be able to do a live stream, but we may not. We will likely not do a forge food feature, although we will be able to go foraging with Daryl Patton again. That's true. We'll um, try, he's doing one try and do that. I, if there's something that's really good, I guess we'll split each other up. But if, if yeah. not, we'll... We, we had a really good time with him last year. Yeah. He, and he let us film that section. So. Yeah. Yeah, um, and so did Amy, because we weren't allowed to film entire talks because they were proprietary. But um, but we were we asked if we could film. Although two family filmed an awful lot of it for them, I believe. Yeah, I think they were. He was sort of the, he was so, he was doing some of the official. So I he think she was some, selling some of it. I think, yeah. or she had it on her. Well, web they have the opportunity to. At least yeah. So um, so we we did little clips of this and that, but we did ask if we could film the entire uh, foraging talk and walk and um we're able to get that up so i can't wait to see everyone everybody bring your jello everybody Hi. bring your jello to uh homesteaders of america there's going to be a jello cook-off <laughs> the jello cook-off competition right um from the hotel rooms to the conference <laughs> you gotta bring it if it doesn't survive it wasn't a good recipe you gotta you gotta get it to the location <laughs> Oh no! Um, like, I'm trying to remember. There's some crazy stuff that I've seen. Yeah, well, a quick. You might have to photobomb a live stream. Well, um, our live stream Sunday night, so the conference will be over by then, and we'll probably be getting in on Sunday night. We could do a live stream anytime. We could do a live stream sometime during the week, and maybe we can uh, say hi to people while we meet people. 
Uh, I know a lot of people last year were kind of going through and saying it was like a big homesteaders YouTube reunion almost go through here's this person here's that person just had a whole montage of who's at the conference um, we might do a little more of that this year last year we focused more on who is talking and not so much who was there watching uh, but we might kind of film a little more and I believe well, with two days it's gonna also give a little more time because yeah. it was a really it was in the morning everything was, finished up by like five yeah uh, they were gonna have a bonfire but people kind of burned out and didn't really hang out um, and even the hotels and stuff people kind of were uh, tired yeah so I think with the two day you're gonna create a lot more opportunity for interaction and slow things down a little bit yeah uh, and add more content so that'll be that'll be good yeah so, yes, yeah, so we'll have to say goodnight for tonight, but we will see you guys next week, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and we'll have another Forge Food feature next week. So I hope you guys enjoy the show, and I will say goodnight. Goodnight.